Right, guys, how's it going? The audio might be a little bit off in this, as I've got a bit of a frog in my throat. However, the world continues to spin, and the tech world continues to dish out the drama. Which means it's time for yet another report on everyone's favourite anti-consumer and anti-competitive company, that's Intel, of course, shenanigans. I can't remember exactly what video it was, but it was a couple of years ago towards the end of 2017 where I said that 2018 would be a very dirtily fought year in tech. AMD had come back strong in 2017 with Ryzen, and towards the end of the year, their sales had begun to pick up. But Intel still had a clear lead in single-threaded performance and in many games. A big concern for them, though, was the existence of Threadripper, which back in 2017 had 16 cores, and this huge increase in core count at the high end forced Intel to change previous plans of first of all launching only 10 cores on their platform, that was Intel's original plan for Skylake X, 10 cores, then they increased that to 12 before finally realising that, in fact, they had to launch the whole 18 cores just to stay ahead. But most telling for me back in 2017 was how the server chip Naples scaled with extra cores and chiplets. Very close to 100% scaling. And this made me realise in this You're Beaten Intel video that Zen was the real deal. And at some point within the next couple of years, Intel would likely be in a lot more trouble. But we very quickly realised that they would not go out quietly. And in this video, Epic wins, Intel prepares to fight dirty, we learned of Intel's plot to downplay Epic as a glued together, repurposed desktop CPU while also noting AMD's dubious track record on supply. Of course, AMD's supply issues were in fact caused by Intel bribing OEMs like Dell and HP billions of dollars to not use AMD CPUs. AMD had such terrible supply issues that they couldn't even give 1 million CPUs away to HP for free because it wasn't worth HP losing the Intel rebate had they accepted the free CPUs. But this multi-page hit piece document for sure set out Intel's stall and was a major reason why I predicted things would get ugly in 2018. And for the first part of this video, I'll recap much of what Intel got up to last year. In fact, 2018 was something of an anus horribilis for Intel. It started with a story that went on to dominate the headlines throughout the year, as Intel reeled from one security vulnerability to the next. Spectre and Meltdown were here, and clearly Intel were affected far more drastically than AMD, with AMD claiming invulnerability to Meltdown and quick fixes for Spectre. Intel released this blog, however, and we're sure to note that they were working with AMD and ARM to solve the issue constructively, bringing your competitors down by association. But then in March, we were treated to something altogether absurd with the launch of the AMD Flaws website and accompanying videos from Israeli security company CS Labs. After some heavy scrutiny by Anantec, who brought in industry veteran David Cantor, the security experts beat a hasty retreat, leaving some deep questions unanswered regarding possible attempts to manipulate the stock. I also covered the whole episode in this AMD Flaws video and concluded that I wouldn't be at all surprised had our friends at Intel had some involvement in it. The thing about this was, in a year, when Intel's flaws were never out of the news, it was this one, this one in particular, which was basically a non-story from the outset, actually made the biggest headlines. AMDflaws.com now redirects to ctslabs.com, and there is no sign of the previous dirty work, except for this line promising a publication soon. However, clicking on the past publications list shows no such publication. And we didn't have to wait all that long, just until June and Computex, when Intel's next shenanigan was exposed. But not before a bunch of tech press rather dimly fell for it. I am of course referring to the infamous 5 GHz, the other one I mean, Intel's 5 GHz 28 core monster CPU. We just caught wind of a 32 core Threadripper incoming at Computex. But that was no surprise to any of us, as we already knew from the previous year that Zen's architecture allowed for 32 cores on one server package. We can all do the maths. 32 cores will crush 18 cores. Intel did, however, also have a 28-core server CPU to fall back on. And we were truly amazed to see all 28 on display, running at 5GHz. Rest in pieces, Threadripper. 
Well, not quite. You see, Intel had forgotten to mention that they had overclocked the CPU, and also that they had to use a 1700 watt industrial chiller to keep the chip cool at 5 GHz. A chiller that, incidentally, is banned in both the EU and North America for its use of R22 gas. Now, never mind that this 28-core 5 GHz monster CPU was clearly being marketed at gamers, while Intel later admitted it would be a workstation-grade CPU launching at the end of the year. And we finally got it to the W3175X, launching with a 3.1 GHz base clock and 3.8 GHz boost. Forgetting about a 61% overclock at Computex is one thing. Manipulating benchmarks is another altogether. But in October 2018, that is exactly what we got. Intel were just about to launch the i9-9900K, and rather than go through the usual review avenues, like for example the tech press, whose job it has been for decades, Intel instead decided to hire the ironically named Principled Technologies to benchmark their new chip instead. The resulting processor study of the i9-9900K and their competitors over 19 popular games raised quite a few eyebrows. First up was Total War Warhammer 2, where the result in the laboratory battle benchmark heavily favoured the 9900K over AMD's competing 2700X. 52% ahead for the 9900K? That is quite a result. But possibly not all that surprising given that the laboratory benchmark is sponsored by Intel. An Intel-sponsored benchmark being benchmarked in an Intel-sponsored processor study. Why am I not surprised? But that was just the start of the shenanigans. In Gears of War 4, I noted that the 2700X was even further behind, while also pointing out the utterly ludicrous 13,600% advantage for the Intel chip in the GPU-bound benchmark. Another 50% win over the 2700X followed in Ashes of the Singularity. And by this point, I was beginning to smell a rat. A really, really smelly rat as it turned out, as the 9900K's mammoth 42% victory in Assassin's Creed Origins had me reeling with incredulity. But even weirder than that was, these Threadripper chips weren't anywhere near as far behind, when normally the 2700X would have been considered AMD's fastest gaming CPU. Reaching the end of this study, we finally understood the reason why the 2700X was performing so poorly. Principal Technologies had provided a step-by-step -step breakdown of the actions that they took to get the results that they got. And I noted that the person who did these benchmarks clearly knew what they were doing in order to get a fair benchmark. For example, removing performance bias options in the BIOS. They also clearly knew that on their final point, on AMD systems, download and install the AMD Ryzen Master Utility, launch the utility, select Game Mode, and click Apply would reduce the number of cores on all the AMD systems by half. So the 8-core 16-thread 2700X was now effectively a quad-core 8-thread CPU. And it's very easy to win in heavily multi-threaded games like Ashes of the Singularity and Assassin's Creed when you hobble your main competitor by disabling half of its cores. It came as zero surprise to me when I learned that Intel were also a sponsor of Principal Technologies' expert benchmark suite, as well as others like Sysmark from Bapco. As I said in this video, Intel's history of contrived benchmarks, Principal Technologies, my arse. I also noted that a certain Ryan Shroud, who we'll hear quite a bit more about later on in this video, he used both of these benchmarks in his test suite, benchmarks where Threadripper was losing to the i5. A few weeks later, a certain Ryan Shrout joined Intel as their chief performance strategist, a move which had me wondering on my Discord why exactly performance needed a strategy, unless Intel would like to change how their performance was being seen. So that was 2018, and it was indeed fought quite dirtily by Intel, but possibly not as bad as I had imagined it would be. However, at the end of 2018, in another video I can't quite recall, I noted that as Intel got ever more desperate, 2019 would make the previous year look like child's play. Not a lot happened in the early part of the year, or maybe more likely is that Intel got away with whatever they did. 
But if 2018 was bad for them from a security perspective, 2019 was proving to be even worse, with each new month bringing new vulnerabilities. One of the worst came in May, with the MDS vulnerability leading Intel to declare that disabling hyperthreading on chips previous to the 8th generation may be warranted. Yep, your i7 7700K, it's probably better off, or at least safer, as an i5 7600K, but much worse than that was the way that Intel dealt with the situation. According to the Dutch publication NRC, Intel offered to pay the researchers a $40,000 reward to allegedly get them to downplay the severity of the vulnerability and also backed that $40,000 offer with an additional $80,000. The research team, however, politely refused both offers before telling Intel to disclose the vulnerability on the 14th or the university would publish the information themselves. With the researchers being quoted as saying, if it were up to Intel, they would have wanted to wait another six months. Intel now has their bug bounty program, which rewards finders of vulnerabilities with anything between $500 and up to $100,000. The catch? You have to keep mum about it, obviously. And given how many security vulnerabilities Intel has had outed this year, how many more do you think are going undisclosed as finders opt to collect these bounties instead? A couple of months later, in July, and drama was incoming at the AMD subreddit, which to be fair is never far away from drama. This time the benchmarking website User Benchmark came under scrutiny for their curious decision to adjust the score weighting mechanism in their benchmark. Now the average score in their benchmark is weighted much more heavily in favour of single-threaded performance than multi-core performance due to the unrealistic scores from all CPUs over 8 cores which includes AMD Ryzen 3000 processors. Previously, user benchmarks weighed single-core performance as 40% of the score, quad-core as 50%, and multi-core as 10%. However, due to the unrealistic scores of many core CPUs like the Ryzen 3000 series, user benchmark decided to change their weighting system to 40% single-core, 58% quad-core, and 2% multi-core. Now, whether Intel's marketing money found a way to them, I simply don't know. However, there is no disclosure of any sort on the website to suggest that that happened. If I were part of Intel's marketing strategy, I'd certainly consider a website with around 10 million visitors every month to be a good place to start. And I also note that the top three CPUs are all Intel CPUs. But again, that's not really proof of any money changing hands. But what I do know is that choosing to change their benchmark weighting right after AMD's new chips arrived on the scene, that smells a bit off, regardless of whatever their true intentions were. Why would you do that? I mean, guys, you're going to have to accept that if the AMD fanboys get upset with you, it's because that decision looks rotten, regardless of your true intentions. Why would you do that? My suspicions weren't exactly abated when in the following month, Intel's VP of Tech Leadership Marketing, John Carville, and Chief Performance Strategist Ryan Shrout revealed their latest baby, real-world performance testing. And they showed that, just as appears to be the case over at User Benchmark, lower-threaded applications should be given more weight in reviews. Coming under particular fire was Maxon's Cinebench. You know the one that AMD really likes to use a lot in their benchmarks. With Intel claiming that it appears in 82% of tech press reviews, Yet in the real world, it appears in only 0.22% of the near 11 million tested systems. Of course, these near 11 million tested systems were all notebooks and two-in-ones, which are not the kind of platform where you'd expect to be doing a lot of heavy productivity. Also note that Intel is offering to help OEMs and press with realistic usage performance testing. I wonder what exactly that help entails. I guess I could take them up in that offer. Over at Extreme Tech, where Intel is suddenly very concerned with real-world benchmarking, they noted, Intel has been only too happy to use Maxon Cinebench as a benchmark at times when its own CPU cores were dominating performance. Before continuing with, Intel's Ryan Shrout wrote on a topic that's very near and dear to their hearts, real-world performance. And he said, Intel had been holding these events for a few months now, beginning at Computex and then at E3. 
and the process has reinforced their opinion on synthetic benchmarks. They provide value if you want a quick and narrow perspective on performance. They still use them internally, and know many of you do as well, but the reality is they are increasingly inaccurate in assessing real-world performance for the user, regardless of the product segment in question. However, he then demonstrated the supposed inferiority of synthetic tests by showing 14 separate results, 10 of which are drawn from 3 Mark and PC Mark, both of which are generally considered to be synthetic applications. And then he did the same again in the comparison against ARM. It seems to me that real-world performance is only very near and dear to Intel's hearts when it suits them, and they remain open to using synthetics. Synthetics like expert benchmarks that they played a major part in developing when that suits them. We're in October and Intel is meeting competition with their scale advantage and financial horsepower. This is a legit Intel internal slide. The source has been correct on two different topics since this point, including Chris Hook leaving, and from what I heard, he's not actually going to Nuvaya, but we'll see about that. And if I could only find out where this money was going. And around that same time in early October, I got this huge info dump, mostly on Intel. Note that the part on Ponte Vecchio already came true, and another part of the information that I got was on Intel's 9000 series. That's their Cascade Lake AP and up to 56 glued together cores doesn't really exist. Or, to be more accurate, they can't be bought anywhere, and they never could be. And this piece of information was also confirmed very quickly in a leaked ASUS slide, which showed Cascade Lake with only up to 28 cores per socket, not 56. This is important because this 56 core fantasy chip was almost certainly created simply for marketing purposes. From the outset, I said that the TDP was just ludicrous, and no OEM would even consider sticking these in a box. In fact, Patrick Kennedy over at Serve the Home, he reported some time ago that no vendor had announced mainstream support for the 9200 series, but that the chip was, however, quite capable in certain niche HPC applications. And at the very end of the article, he noted that Intel, however, are not positioning the Platinum 9200 series as a high-performance computing part rather than a mainstream product. The company is, however, using the Platinum 9200 series as a Halo benchmark vehicle in segment comparisons outside of the narrowly defined HPC niche. This was back in June, and the point of it we discovered a month ago when Intel's strategy team yet again came under fire for publishing intentionally misleading benchmarks. Intel had apparently, in the case of Gromax at least, used an older version which disadvantaged Zen 2. In the latest version, 2019.4, there was a small but very important fix added AMD Zen 2 detection, which says... The AMD Zen 2 architecture is now detected as different from Zen 1 and uses 256-bit wide AVX2 by default. This has a significant impact on performance. And after that, there was some discussion on the testing methodology and a note that the Epic was apparently only running one thread per core instead of two. Turbo was enabled on the Epic, but disabled on the Xeon. You might think that's a good thing for AMD, but the author pointed out that in Gromax, transitions in and out of AVX512 code can lead to differences in boost clocks, which can impact performance. Intel also added more NUMA nodes on the AMD platform and also passed up the opportunity to increase the CTDP to the maximum allowed 240 watts for the 7742. So essentially, with these HPC performance leadership benchmarks from Intel, we're looking at a 400 watt CPU up against AMD's 225-watt CPU. The conclusion was fairly damning. One can only conclude that Intel's Performance at Intel blog is not a reputable attempt to present factual information. It is simply a way for Intel to publish misinformation to the market in the hope that people do not do the diligence to see what is backing the claims. And all of that with a part which doesn't really exist in the mainstream market. As it happens though, Intel retested with the updated Gromax and found almost no difference in performance. In a follow-up interview next day with Serve the Home, 
it was pointed out that the one thread per core on Epic was a typo, and in fact both CPUs had two threads per core. So in other words, Intel maintain that their results are legitimate. The problem here though is, nobody has a 9282 to test, and they likely never will have. So at some point, we're looking to Intel for those numbers, and it is up to us and our readers to decide whether the optimizations Intel present are acceptable. And under broader perspective, I found this point 0.5 pretty interesting. For the author pointed out that the disclosures are not easy to find, given their citations. And he was told that the company has a project to improve that? I'll get to this disclosure point later on, but to finish on this topic, it seems that Intel are doing their own benchmarks now and expecting us to just swallow them without any means of verification. These results could be legitimate. However, at best, they will have been cherry-picked to the extreme, and there will certainly be many cases where even Intel's 400-watt part gets beaten by the 225-watt ROM. But without the CPUs to test, we'll never know. Hot on the heels of that marketing mishap came yet another. This time apparently the i3 is better than the Ryzen 7. More specifically, the i3-8145U is better than the Ryzen 7 3700U. And we're not kidding, Intel even promises up to 65% better overall performance. But do note the up to, and these other up to's. Over at Medium, however, the author compared the 3700U to Intel's 8-thread i5-8250U, and he found that the AMD chip was even faster than that. So how then is it possible that this dual-core i3 can be so much better than the quad-core Ryzen 7? Simple, really. You just do what you've been doing and cherry-pick the benchmarks. This marketing presentation apparently appeared over at a Thai IT retailer in order to persuade clueless consumers into buying Intel products. I wasn't able to dig up the full deck for this, but these are clearly Intel slides. I was, however, able to dig up this deck, which was created in September this year, and pretty quickly we see where this is going to go, with this whole real-world angle again. And in the next slide, you get a split between mainstream PC uses and high-end desktop uses. That looks like Cinebench coming under fire again, while Intel promotes Sysmark and Expert again. Sysmark apparently is the best proxy for real programs, using real applications, and Web Expert from Principal Technologies represents real worldwide application use cases. A bit later on in this presentation, and I nearly threw my phone at the screen in utter disgust, Sysmark again, of course. Gaming Index? Fair enough. Compute Intensive. Intel has gone and used Spec Rate 2017 Int Base, so they're using the integer load instead of the floating point one. And we know why that is. But much worse than that, though, is the usage of the Rate benchmark, which is a benchmark of throughput or multi core performance. But then they limit it to one thread. That's what this 1T means. This is absolutely horrific marketing at its very worst. And again, web expert from Principal Technologies. And they still hate Cinebench. Something else caught my eye though, in all of these recent benchmarks, and that was also noted by Charlie over at Semi-Accurate in his article last month, Intel Messaging Hits a New Low. Now this article mostly centred on the same Xeon versus Epic benchmarks that we saw over at Serve the Home. What interested me most though was this part where Charlie got to his next point. Recently, the company started to not include the disclaimers and legally mandated disclosures on the materials in question. Instead, they put in a link, which may or may not still be there when you read that article in the future. And then, under links rather than disclosure, there is no question that this is intentional and meant to negate the point of the disclosure. There is no defence for it. It costs Intel no more to add a few lines of the footnote to the blog in question. But they don't. And this skirts the intent of the FTC order because that order would make Intel's claims look even worse than they do now. Now, the disclosure agreement that's being talked about here was forged between Intel and the FTC after Intel settled all of their previous anti-competitive and anti-consumer actions way back in 2009. That disclosure agreement is, and this is the actual Intel decision and order paper, whenever a respondent makes a claim comparing the performance of a mainstream microprocessor 
and a compatible x86 microprocessor, or makes any claim that references the performance of a mainstream microprocessor on any benchmark, respondent shall clearly and prominently make the following disclosure. Software and workloads used in performance tests may have been optimized for performance only on Intel microprocessors. Performance tests, such as SysMark and MobileMark, are measured using specific computer systems, components, software, operations, and functions. Any change to any of those factors may cause the results to vary. And you should consult other information and performance tests to assist you in fully evaluating your contemplated purchase, including the performance of that product when combined with other products. Now, as Charlie said, up until very recently, that exact disclosure was made on any of Intel's marketing materials. Here we can see it on the ninth generation slides for mobile. They're making a bunch of benchmark claims and that exact disclosure starts in line two and also includes a link for more complete information. Visit intel.com forward slash benchmarks. And here again, we see it with the eighth generation. Looking back at the HPC slides on Intel's Medium blog, comparing Xeon and Epic, and that disclosure is now indeed gone on this slide and on this one, replaced by that link to intel.com forward slash benchmarks only. This seems like a clear and flagrant abuse of the FTC's demand. But wait, oh, Intel, you sneaky. The disclosure only mentions mainstream microprocessors specifically. And as we saw over at Serve the Home, the author actually mentioned that these 9,200 series chips, they are not really mainstream chips. At the same time, it is not a mainstream market architecture appropriate for the same markets that the Intel Xeon Gold, Platinum 8200 series and AMD Epic servers are targeted at. So Intel can justify the exclusion of the disclosure here in the case of these HPC slides. But what about the rest? Let's take another look through this September slide deck. Right, here's one on Intel's apparent mega tasking performance lead, where they're claiming a win of 64 frames per second compared to 47 frames per second while streaming and playing PUBG. <laughs> Which to be frank, seems a tad unlikely to me, but we'll run with it. What about the disclosure though? No, no disclosure there. Simply a link to the same benchmark page. And there is no way that the non-mainstream argument can wash here. We are talking about as mainstream as you can get. So that one appears to be cut and dried. Not so fast. Over at AMD's website and their page on the Intel antitrust rulings states that when the form of the promotion does not physically allow room for this language, Intel must state for more complete information about performance and benchmark results, visit www.intel.com forward slash benchmarks. And that website must contain the disclosure language. Oh, Intel, you dirty. There's just not quite enough room, is there? Because Intel has managed to stick a bunch of other stuff in there instead. Stuff like the date of the testing, which would normally be shown in the appendix at the end. Very, very dirty. But wait, maybe I'm giving them just a little bit too much credit. Let's be blunt. Up until now, everything we have seen from Intel's marketing, it is dirty, but it is not very smart. This stuff here is way too clever for guys like Shrout to figure out. And a few slides on, my point is proven. Obvious benchmark, and there is more than enough room for the full disclosure, but instead, we simply have this sentence with the link. And again, in the comparison versus AMD and Ryzen, plenty of room there for the full disclosure. And once again, and once again. And here is one with AI expert. Wonder who wrote that benchmark? And this one in particular is a flagrant abuse of the ruling because Intel clearly has had a major say in the development of this benchmark. We saw that earlier in this video, yet they have failed to include the relevant disclosure. Let's check Carvels and Shrout's real world performance marketing materials, which we just saw recently. So the first benchmark in this doesn't even have the link, let alone a disclosure. Maybe Intel thinks that because it's a high end desktop, it's not mainstream. So they're immune to the ruling in this case. Moving on, and clearly there is more than enough room for the full disclosure there, and there as well, and there as well. And again with AI Expert and every other slide thereafter, with benchmarks, there is clearly enough room for the real disclosure. 
and yet Intel has not included it in any slide. In actual fact, going back to the settlement decision and paragraph 8, it says, where the form of the promotion does not reasonably allow inclusion of this language, that is, the full disclosure, such as an audiovisual advertisement or on a retail tear sheet that is too small to allow inclusion of this language in a font size that would be readable, the respondent then may instead clearly and prominently make the following disclosure. For more complete information about performance and benchmark results, visit www.intel.com forward slash benchmarks, which website shall contain the disclosure set forth in paragraph 8a above. Well, Intel, maybe you can justify whether your CPUs are mainstream or not. And maybe you can justify whether your latest marketing slides cannot reasonably include the full disclosure in readable writing that you had somehow managed to disclose up until very recently. But you'll be justifying it to the FTC Compliance Division, whom I have just reported you to for violating the 2009 Antitrust Settlement. I have also offered my services to the FTC in pursuing a deeper investigation into all of Intel's recent behaviour. Now, to finish this one off, and I ran out of time before I was able to talk about the most recent scandal, this MATLAB scandal, where again it appears that Intel has used a much slower code path when compiling with ICC on AMD CPUs. This was also a major part of the 2009 antitrust settlement, with Intel being forced to disclose whenever ICC was used. This whole topic though, it is just way too large to be included in this video. And to be honest, I haven't looked deeply enough at it to come to a conclusion either way. So, on with the final conclusion. First of all, let's talk about Ryan Shroud, who has clearly had a major part to play in Intel's worsening marketing. From my Ryan Shroud's flawed perspective video, you know that I believe Ryan ran a program of undermining AMD's products, using his website at the time, PC Perspective, as the vehicle. Please note that PC Perspective is under new management and from what I can see are legitimate these days. Ryan also had a rather dubious disregard for disclosure. Operating Shroud Research where he got paid to research hardware before public release and then used that same hardware in his website's reviews. Bit of a conflict of interest there, but to be fair, after I raised this issue, they did include a full disclosure. But is it really surprising that a guy who made a living out of downplaying AMD and failing to disclose is now at Intel downplaying AMD and failing to disclose? These benchmark slides from Intel is effectively their own benchmarks and now without the relevant disclosures. Now, John Carville, who presumably was responsible for giving Shrout the job as chief performance strategist, he's now moved on to Nuvaya. Somebody is going to have to fill that spot as VP of Tech Leadership Marketing. Shrout might just try for that job. He certainly has all the required credentials to do the job. However, he lacks the credibility. Intel's marketing has been a disaster ever since he got there. Linus, 10 million subs absolutely slammed their behaviour over the 10980XE shenanigans. Tech Power Up slammed them over attempting to hide yet another vulnerability. Serve the Home slammed them over the Epic slides. Medium slammed them for the i3 faster than Ryzen 7 claims. Semi-accurate slammed them for more dubious cherry picking with the Comet Lake launch. Whatever Shrout thinks he can get away with, he's clearly not getting away with. It's being exposed by a tech press who simply do not trust him and simply do not trust Intel. And people are just going to say, here's Jim having yet another go at Intel. Believe me, I would like nothing more than Intel to just clean up their acts on multiple fronts, to just behave and to just comply with the rulings against them. But they can't do it. And with guys like Shrout there, they never will do it. I do not hate Intel. In fact, I know many people within the company. The vast, vast majority of Intel employees are absolutely great people. But it only takes a few bad eggs to drag the reputation of the entire company down. And sadly, marketing is the company front. As Charlie over at Semi Accurate said, things have gotten so bad and are so prevalent that there is no way it is unsanctioned from the top. At this point, Semi-Accurate is calling on Intel management to force a change in this behaviour and fire those responsible for this. 
Not necessarily the people lower down on the chain of command who can be easily blamed, but those higher up who set the culture and allow this to happen. Things have long progressed past the point where it is hurting Intel's image and standing as a company. An ethical company would simply not allow this to happen, but Intel is. It is never too late to affect change and start cleaning up the rot if the corporate will is there, is it, at Intel. I am personally not comfortable with demanding people lose their jobs for the simple fact that people have families. However, I will say this for an absolute certainty. So long as Ryan Shrout remains at Intel, in this position, or worse, gets Carvel's old job, there will never, ever be peace between the tech press and Intel. On a personal level, I will never tire of outing this kind of false marketing, and I will never tire of reporting compliance failures to the relevant authorities. In fact, I intend to ramp it up. I believe I said something similar in the past, but if you thought 2019 was a dirtily fought year in tech, 2020 is going to be on a whole new level. See all this stuff here, where Intel is doing what they can to hold on to the last advantages they have? Next year, they're going to lose even that. The only thing left for them then is even dirtier marketing. Or worse. I'll catch you later, guys.